In this lesson, we're discussing five do's and the five don'ts for planting citrus in ground. It was on May 8 that we discussed the seven helpful tips for container planting your citrus tree. And I'm gonna put that link down below this video in the video description. And also, I just wanna give a quick shout out to Four Winds Growers, which is America's leading distributor of citrus trees in the country, shipping a ton of varieties of citrus, whether it be lemons or oranges or grapefruits and so forth. And they have a ton of helpful resources on planting and succeeding with your fruit growing and care needs. Additionally, I wanna do a quick shout out to Growing Citrus in Containers Facebook group. And this is a group that's rapidly approaching 10,000 members and professionally regulated by a group of administrators who are there to make sure that you get the help and the questions to your citrus care needs answered. Their, again, specialty is growing citrus in containers, which applies to pretty much people and growers all around the country and all around the world. So you don't necessarily need to be in a warm grow zone such as I am here in Southern California. In fact, you can be growing citrus in freezing grow zones as long as you learn how to care for them indoors during the coldest months of the year and you learn to acclimate them and bring them out during the warmer months of the year and you can still enjoy delicious nutritional citrus no matter where you are in the world. Hi, my name is Charles Malkew, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants and author of Saving the World with the Home Garden. And as you know, of all of the citrus, my favorite are the lemons. And in particular, the reason is that we use them for marinades. We, in fact, haven't even bought salad dressing in I'd say well over a decade, because again, we rely on our lemons for making the salad dressings that then get incorporated into all the varieties of salads that we make, in addition to, again, marinating meats, and of course, the occasional lemonade. So on this property, we've got in ground, I think it's seven lemon trees. And just a few weeks ago, together with my daughters, we harvested over 110 pounds of Meyer lemons from my standard restock Meyer lemon trees. Just behind me here is the Eureka lemon, which is, as most people would say, the most common of the store-bought flavor lemons. Um, the Eureka lemon is one, and the other one is the Lisbon lemon that are very similar in taste and quality and also commercially grown varieties of lemons. And what I have over here, and what I'm also most excited to share with you today is the Genoa, or sometimes referred to as the Genova Italian lemon variety. And what's so cool about this variety, and as you can see here with the Eureka lemon that's very upright, compared to the Meyer lemons when we harvested those a few weeks ago that are very compact and bushy, the Genoa is something in between the compact bushy nature of the Meyer lemon and the upright growth pattern of the Eureka lemon. So the Genova is a um, more of a blend, more of a bush structure lemon. And also at the end of the day, the goal is it's gonna be easiest for harvesting and getting those lemons within reach. A couple things I wanna to read to you just to make sure I get this in is that it's similar to the Eureka lemon in flavor, um, popular for its cold hardiness, dense foliage, and its vigorous growth. The lemon grows in a shrub-like form, again, allowing it to grow wide rather than tall, and at the end of the day, just making it easier to harvest those lemons. This lemon tree that I'm holding is the entry size, which is the smallest and the easiest to ship. If you want a more mature lemon tree, an additional year or two older, you can get what is known as um, the premium size, 24 to 36 inch um, measuring citrus tree. And I just wanna read from Four Winds Growers, the description on this one is that it was introduced into California from Genoa, Italy in 1875. Similar characteristics again to the Eureka lemon. In regions of Chile and Argentina, it is grown commercially and appreciated for its cold resistance. That might be really important to those of you growing citrus in colder zones lush and dense foliage. The rind has a high oil content, so the fruit is great for lemoncello and other recipes calling for a tart juice and lemon zest. This tree is grafted on a semi-dwarf rootstock, so that'll allow you to have a medium-sized tree, a semi-dwarf. Dwarf on average will grow about three to five feet, maybe seven on, you know, at the higher spectrum but a semi-dwarf tree will grow on average, typically at a low of about five to six feet and can grow as tall as 15 feet. But again, they're easier to control with pruning 
such as, again, this here behind me is a semi-dwarf rootstock Eureka lemon tree. And right now it's measuring about 10 feet tall, but I always keep it in check to about eight feet because that's about where my reach is. Without any further ado, let's get started with my five do's and don'ts for planting your citrus tree. So I'm gonna start off with a do not. Do not plant your trees deep and do not even prepare the hole too deep. You can prepare it wider, but take a look. When preparing the hole, I'm only going as deep as the container, but I can definitely go wider as I want the roots to flare out, but I don't want the tree to sink in the hole that I prepared. One of the leading issues that I'm seeing among growers across the country is that they're uprooting their plants after two, three, four or more years because it's not fruiting, it's not growing properly. And they'll notice that the flare out from the root, which is near the surface and the topsoil and the top inch or two is several inches deep and just getting deeper again, because they started off with a hole that was too deep and the tree is just sinking in that planting hole and the roots are just getting smothered and buried too deep below the topsoil. And keep in mind that about 70 to 80% of the air roots are responsible for, as I just said in the name, air roots are responsible for bringing in oxygen into the plant and also the exchange of nutrients at that topsoil level when you're going to fertilize or with the wood chips and mulch, which we're gonna be discussing shortly. All of those are happening in the first few inches of the soil. And actually, again, by as much as 70, 80%. So again, if it's sinking in that planting hole, it's going to ultimately shorten that plant's life or affect ultimately the productivity of your um, fruitful trees. So what we're doing again when checking out your planting hole, again, you only want to go as deep as the depth of your container. But you can see that I prepared a hole a lot larger. So my do not is do not prepare a deep hole. You can definitely go a little bit wider. So this here is a nice hole for this entry size tree, my Genoa Italian lemon. So here are several products that I found that can be used to amend the soil as I prepare the planting hole. And what I want you to be most aware of, and one of the, an, another biggest mistake that I see, is that a lot of people will be buying potting soil and using that for their in-ground planting. And so that's another do not, is do not be using a potting soil mix, as a potting soil mix is designed to help retain moisture, improve aeration, do all of these things to help improve the condition of your in pot citrus plant. However, if you're using your potting mix for in ground plantings, again, what your, your potting mix is doing is helping to retain moisture between watering. Again, that potted container, as soon as you water it, most of the water is leached out. Compared to in ground, that water will stay there for several days longer, again, compared to that potted plant. So it's important for your potting mix to help retain moisture better. And with that, what you've got are products such as perlite, which looks like the snowy product. And then you've got vermiculite, which is another good potting mix, which looks like fool's gold over here. This here is a little damp. And another good product for potting mixes is sphagnum peat moss. And you can take a look at that. It's just broken down peat moss. And you can also just buy products like this, which says for your raised beds and potting mixes. And when you take a look at it, you can see this perlite and other products in there that help with retaining moisture, something you would not want to be doing if it's going in ground. Again, if it's retaining too much moisture if for your in-ground planting, it'll contribute towards rot and a phenomenon known as root rot on your plant. And again, that's going to shorten the health and life of your plants. So avoid potting mixes for your in-ground plantings and use something more like this. If you don't make your own compost on your property, you can use something like this, which is an amend. And there's other products which are designed for your in-ground plantings. And it'll save so even on the products themselves to make sure that you're using the right product for your plants. And when you take a look at the contents of this product, you can see that there's no perlite, no vermiculite. And in fact, it just looks like I can see wood chips and it's all of like these forest products, maybe composted leaves and so forth. And again, this here is what we're gonna be using for our in-ground plantings. Now, when improving the planting hole, most people would take their compost and add it to the bottom of the hole, trying to loosen the bottom of the hole to help encourage those lower roots to get into the softer soil. 
So I would add very little, if any, to the very bottom base of your planting hole, maybe a handful. I would contribute maybe no more than about five or 10% compost and then integrate that into the native soil to help maybe with that transition. But the old style, the old research planting guides would simply say to mix 50% compost with 50% native soil and use that for your planting hole. And again, that's the reason that plants sink in their planting hole, resulting in those air roots and those top flare roots to end up being several inches below the soil instead of right where you intended to put them at the beginning. And again, that all starts off with a deep hole and then amending the native soil with too much compost. So all I'm doing here today is I'm simply gonna put a handful of compost. I'm then just gonna add about a tablespoon or two of the Ivory Organics all-purpose fertilizer. I'm using the Super Blend, which has plus azomite. All azomite is simply volcanic crushed rock, which helps also in addition to giving your plants all six plant macronutrients, which include your NPK and magnesium, sulfur, and calcium. So all six macronutrients, as you can see here, contains all primary nutrients, contains all secondary nutrients. With azomite, it has a lot of the micronutrients as well to give your plants optimal plant health. And we're simply gonna add about a tablespoon or two to the base of the hole. And not just because of the macro and micronutrients, but it also has a lot of beneficial microbes in there as well, which include beneficial bacteria, so as you can see, we've only improved the bottom inch of the potting hole. What we're gonna do now is get ready to up pot our Genoa Italian lemon. So we're gonna start here with the container. You can see that there's a little hole here at the bottom, which is gonna help with pushing the root ball out. I'm gonna help soften around the container like so with my fingers. And now we're just gonna push it out and pull a little bit on the stem and check out that beautiful healthy root system. And what I'm gonna do first is check out the topsoil and see where the roots flare from. Because sometimes in some nurseries, we'll add inches of soil to the top. So when you think you're putting it at the very top of where the root flare is into your planting hole, sometimes again, the nurseries just wanna have, you know, and show off the fact that it's a full pot of soil at the top. But in fact, they're actually burying where the root flare is. But you can see, but the roots are coming right here near the surface and we're ready to go. What we're gonna do to help wake up the roots is simply rub the outside a little bit gently like so, just to let it know that it's out of the container and now going into the planting hole. I'm also gonna take off um, about a quarter inch, half an inch of soil near the bottom to let these roots know it's time for you to go into your planting hole. And now we're simply gonna put it down. One other thing I wanna share with you is you can check out the graft which is, this here is the rootstock, which controls the size of the tree. This one here, again, being a semi-dwarf, it could be a standard, if it was, it was a standard rootstock, then it would make a standard size tree, or if it was a dwarf rootstock, it would make a dwarf size tree. And then this here is the Genoa that was grafted on it. And this is gonna ensure that we're gonna have exactly Genoa Italian lemons growing on top of this particular rootstock, which is controlling not just size, but also disease resistance and other benefits such as drought tolerance and nematode resistance and so forth. So this tree is now ready to go in the planting hole. And now we're gonna backfill it with native soil. So as we're filling the hole back, I'm going with my fingers and simply adding a little pressure around the root ball, eliminating any air pockets, because if there's any air pockets around the root ball, that's gonna contribute towards those roots drying out. You wanna make sure those roots are in contact with soil. So again, I'm just gently adding some pressure as I'm backfilling the native soil around the tree. And we can see that the roots are still here near the top. You can see all that root flare that's happening at the top. And I'm still about an inch or two away from filling this in. And now I'm coming back with the compost that we pulled out of the bag. And we're now going to integrate it with the native soil. And this is the way compost is intended to be in nature. Is it supposed to be in the top soil, in the top one to three inches of the soil? and it's gonna break down there and that's where the worms are gonna come and spend most of their time in that topsoil, breaking down the compost materials, breaking down the fertilizer that we introduce and helping to enrich the entire root ball with each deep watering that we do for the tree. So um, that's my helpful tip is when you improve the soil conditions, just keep that improvement near the top. In the winter, when the light hours are the shortest and the temperatures are the coldest, 
you're gonna wanna be feeding your plants the least, but not necessarily nothing, and we'll get to that in a minute. In spring, you wanna start warming up your plants. Here in Southern California, I'm here in Los Angeles, we're gonna start fertilizing our plants in as early as February, early February. For us, that's like spring temperatures in a lot of the rest of the country, even though it's not necessarily spring as it would be, you know, obviously come March 21st. Summer, you're gonna wanna feed your plants the maximum amount. Light hours are the longest and the temperatures are the warmest. So you're gonna wanna give your plants the maximum dose. If you're feeding your plants organically, the best time to do so is May, as you're gonna need about a month of those soil biology, which are gonna be your earthworms, beneficial bacteria, and mycorrhizae to break down those organic products and make sure they're available come summer peak, which is gonna be in June. And so, here we are, winter, spring, summer building up. By fall, we're gonna cut back to the spring, you know, amounts, relative amounts by early fall. And winter, we're gonna um, basically cut back to the lowest doses. And you can see our fertilizer curve, I'll do here in red, is basically warming up and feeding your plants more. In the winter months, consider, and this is an important time for considering doing your foliar feeding, which I'll put a video link that, down below in the description of this video, where you can see a, the Ivory Organics foliar tea bags and how that can be used also as a nutritional spray to your plants to make sure that the leaves are picking up everything when it comes to the macro and micronutrients to turn those plants very quickly from yellow to green and making sure that it has all of the nutrients necessary for optimal performance of both blooms and fruit, fruit set and fruit yield. So again, being a new planting, not only are we offering the plants all the macro, but a lot of the micronutrients, but again, being that it's so new, we're just gonna introduce a little bit of fertilizer. And also here we are in late January and it really doesn't need that much plant food, but we're gonna give it to make sure that the soil biology begins to warm up and the plant also has available all of the macronutrients. But again, we're gonna visit the plant in about a month and then start offering it a lot more. We can also do again that foliar nutritional spray, to make, which is a very light, very, very light way of feeding your plant and making sure again, the plants are getting a lot of the macro and micronutrients for optimal plant health and, and growth. And now we're simply gonna water the product down. So as you can see with this kind of drip irrigation system that we've got happening, most growers will actually have one on each side of the tree trunk to ensure that water goes all the way around. The only reason that we're seeing this entire root zone getting watered now is predominantly because we just planted it. But if you wanna take a look at the other citrus trees, you'll see that the water is happening on just one side of the tree and the other side is dry and that is not ideal to the soil biology. Imagine again, the earthworms and the beneficial bacteria and the mycorrhizae that's below the soil. You're gonna to wanna to make sure, and especially in that top soil area, those top few inches, which again is where most of those air roots are, and that exchange between the air and the um, nutrients, you're gonna wanna make sure all that gets moisture. And if it's only one side of the tree that's getting the moisture, then the other side of the tree is suffering. So something we'll do is we'll come with our hose at least once or twice a month and soak the entire root zone to ensure again that the soil that we're enriching, whether it be through compost and also the addition of fertilizers is getting moisture so again, that beneficial biology can benefit and ultimately benefit the surrounding tree. So this here is another example. You can see the moisture is on this side of the plant. Chances are this entire part of the root zone, as I see it, is still dry. Even though as the moisture is going deeper and deeper, it is you know pretty much catering to a lot of the root ball. All of these air roots on this side are relatively dry. And so again, it's a good practice to at least once or twice a month, make sure that you're soaking the entire root zone. If you don't have a good drip irrigation that's soaking the entire topsoil around your fruit trees and other plants you might have in your garden. So about a week or two ago, we harvested 110 pounds of Meyer lemons off of these three standard rootstock Meyer lemons. And there's still a few lemons hanging on here. It's getting back into going into the bloom phase. But when it comes to your tree structure, what I wanna share with you is that the umbrella shape is the best structure for your lemons to protect the underlying tree trunk 
and those lower branches. As I was like calling it, is the heart of the tree, that tree trunk and the lower branches. As long as those are healthy and not exposed to too much sun, where they can experience first, second, and third degree sunburns, as we've demonstrated in videos over the years, not just with citrus, but it can be roses, it can be avocados, it can be your figs, it can be any other tree that's getting too much sun on its trunk and on those branches. They will burn as we're going now into our winter months and into spring and ultimately summer. Our light hours are gonna go from 10 hours in the winter to 12 by spring and 14 hot hours by June. So it's important that the tree has this umbrella shape to help shade and protect the heart of the tree. When it comes to the Eureka lemon, being that it's so upright compared to the bushy nature of the Meyer lemon, you can see that a lot of the tree trunk is getting quite a bit of light down there. And the last time the entire structure was whitewashed, which we're gonna be discussing in just a moment, was over a year ago. But overall, most of the whitewash product has grown out of the tree over the course of the last year or two as the girth, as the tree continues to grow, pushing off those outer layers and putting up new bark. So whatever you're whitewashing on the product, it's really important that you're doing so organically, which we're gonna get to in just a minute. When feeding your plants, do not use synthetic fertilizer, which are the man-made. Some people refer them as chemical, but chemical can be organic and the synthetic man-made stuff. Take a look at this stuff. You may be familiar with using products such as this, but it's not the only one. It doesn't have to be blue or red or even white. These are, you know, pretty much just salt crystals, but keep in mind that these products have a lot of salts in them, which can harm the soil and ultimately harm the plant and the plant's ability to uptake moisture from the soil. Additionally, these products leach a lot faster than the organic products, making their way into the local environment and ultimately are the one oceans that we share. And another really important consideration when not using synthetic fertilizers on your plants is that it's doing nothing to improve the soil biology. This will not feed the earthworms, it will not feed the beneficial bacteria, and ultimately you may even be harming and hurting the soil biology, something you do not want to do, especially in an organic garden, where you want to have sustainable, healthy, continuous, optimal growth from your plants. So that's just a few of my top reasons for not using synthetic fertilizers in your garden. My next helpful do's is to whitewash your plant as soon as you plant it. A lot of pros will say the day you plant a tree is the day you whitewash a tree. And the reason is most of these plants, when created from the nurseries and, the, and even before that, the growers, were always in close proximity to one another, naturally shading the underlying tree trunk and branches. Just as we explained earlier, one of the best growth patterns for a tree is to have that umbrella shape to naturally protect from the sun, the underlying tree trunk and lower branches. But especially in this condition where it's so upright and skinny and the sun is gonna be coming and hitting that tree trunk for starting here in late January, about 10 to 11 hours, going to 12 by spring, and ultimately 14 hours by summer. And until this grows a canopy that can more naturally protect those underlying tree trunks and branches, what we're gonna do is now whitewash it using the Ivory Organic three-in-one plant guard offering protection from damaging summer sunburn, insects, and rodents for use on your roses, fruit, nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. And it's for use in organic production and healthier than latex paint and tar-based products, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. And I've got this can. I've used a little less water, um, but again, it was probably up to about here. I've kept it more in the tree paste consistency. And what we're gonna simply do is simply paint. Now, the tree trunk, you can see the grafting wound that's right there. We're gonna protect the graft as well. And it's ultimately gonna protect it from pests and disease. And as well as offering that sunburn protection. So here we've basically coated the rootstock. And now we're going up this unprotected scion wood, which is the flavor of this Genoa Italian lemon going up. And we can keep on protecting these stems, wherever there is no leaves, to ensure that it's not gonna be at risk of any first, second, or third degree sunburn. This entire backside does not necessarily need to be painted because the sun is only coming in from this side here in the Northern Hemisphere. It's only the South and Southwest side of the tree that's gonna be exposed to the most amount of sun. The backside is relatively in the shade, even in the summer, but I'm going to 
offer protection to the backside as well as it will offer protection from girdling rodents and which has been an issue here in our garden and that will offer protection in that way as it's got as you can see here with this three-in-one plant guard these active ingredient oils which include castor which is the rodent repellent in addition to the mints which you'll see as we read down cinnamon clove garlic peppermint rosemary and spearmint as well as diatomaceous earth which are in the inert ingredients offer also insect repellent protection what we can also do when it comes to whitewashing the plant and this can over here can make up to five gallons of a dilute foliar spray that can also offer the protection and we're going to simply spray the plant like so and if you take a close look here you can see the leaves they now have a whitewash protection so it too won't burn and it'll also also offer insect protection from aphids and scale and other disease as well and all the directions for use on how it can be used if you take a look here on the back it shows how it can be used for brush on directions you're simply going to fill up the can with water it can also be used as foliar spray directions makes up to five gallons and also can be used as a tree paste by simply adding a lot less water a quarter of a cup compared to this entire can full of water and this now leads to my don'ts. Do not be using latex and tar-based products for accomplishing the same white wash protection that we used using the Ivory Organics formula, which are also OMRI certified for organic gardening, compared to if you're doing things using an organic-based ingredient, such as the Ivory Organics products, which are based on limestone, which is a traditional um, practice, and mica, which is a clay, in addition to using milk proteins, which help with the bonding, diatomaceous earth with the insect repellent protection, as well as the seven natural oils is just the beginning. This here is now my fifth do's is be sure to add wood chips, also known as mulch around your trees. You can see this here I've collected from different parts of my garden. You may have spotted that there's some leaves in here, no big deal, but most of this product I actually got for free from the Griffith Park compost facility, which is just a couple of miles away from here. And it's a program that here in Los Angeles, they basically offer for free from all of the tree management throughout the city, whether they be dead trees or prune trees that are then used in different ways. One, to make these wood chips, which are sourced from obviously tree branches and tree trunks that have been ground up. But then they also can use the mulch to also then make compost by aging it for a while. And they've also got a free source for compost there as well. And I've attended a few of their lectures there. And I know that they put a lot of time, energy, and resources into making sure that these products are sourced from a place that does not collect trees that have been treated with herbicides and so forth, which can harm the plants if you don't know where the products are coming from. Another helpful tip when it comes to mulching around your plants is to get trees from diverse areas. When you're simply buying a bag of compost from the big box store, that's typically sourced from just one tree, compared to if you can actually source it from your neighborhood, as well as, again, this is a city um, run project where they're collecting trees from all over the city and basically blending them together. You can see different piles and you can see the different colors and different consistencies. And the goal is you're trying to bring the value of all of those different plants into your garden. What helped make those thriving and healthy trees once upon a time will now be used to help improve the health and condition of your plants here. And you're also removing the stuff from what would otherwise end up in landfills and wasting space um, around our planet, going to landfills instead of benefiting your home garden. So mulching, when it comes to mulching, you simply wanna add a one to three inch layer of wood chips around each of your plants. So if you take a look here, you're simply gonna be taking these wood chips and spreading them around the base of the tree. And when doing so, one of the don'ts is to make sure that you do not allow these wood chips to come in contact with the tree trunk as the wood chips absorb and add moisture and contribute to moisture to the soil. You don't want that happening to the tree trunk. You wanna keep the tree trunk dry and, um, and basically not exposed to the additional moisture, which can now lead to, we talked about root rot, this would be a phenomenon known as stem rot, where the moisture from the wood chips would add additional moisture to the stem of the citrus plant. So we're simply gonna take these wood chips and basically build the wood chips away from the plant. And ideally we're gonna add about one to three inches. So I'm gonna have to collect some more wood chips and basically build a pile up and around and away from the trunk 
of the tree. So again, we're gonna start low here, maybe about a quarter of an inch or less, and work our way up to about one, two to three inches of wood chips all around the plant. What that's gonna do now is several things. One, it's gonna help retain moisture between waterings, and that's gonna help save you water. Secondly, it's going to help reduce weeding by as much as 75, 80, 90%, and that's gonna help save your time. So that's two really important, helpful things. Thirdly, as the wood chips break down, it's gonna help enrich the soil. One, benefiting the soil biology, which again includes the earthworm, beneficial bacteria, mycorrhiza, but it's also helping to introduce a lot of the macro and micronutrients that went into making these trees and these leaves and this leaf mold to now benefit your surrounding trees. So that is just a handful of reasons why it's important to also mulch around all of your plants to the ultimate benefit of the surrounding tree. And those are the blossoms. So it's already ready to go in the bloom phase. So I just purchased this plant from Four Winds Growers about three weeks ago. It's been here in the garden. I'm getting ready for this lesson. And, um, and in the meantime, it's already gone into this bloom phase and we're so super excited to have a little piece of Italy here in our Los Angeles backyard. And I highly encourage you guys to check them out too. And again, that links to Four Winds Grower will be in the below video description. So if you've enjoyed this lesson brought to you by Ivy Organics, be sure to give us that thumbs up and most importantly, share us with your gardening friends and family. As always, keep growing with Ivy Organics and wishing you all Happy gardening.